Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And together we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics. So we have an exciting episode for you today about what is probably one of the most, if not the most, popular movie in Chinese history. Certainly the most widely seen in terms of if you count multiple viewings. Um, and uh, it's not Wolf Warrior 2. No. Which we also did an episode on. Um, so check that out if you're interested in Wolf Warrior 2, which is probably the most popular modern Chinese film yeah. in terms of viewership. Um, so it's called Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy. And to get to what it is, we have to go back to the Cultural Revolution and even beyond that. It's called Zhi Qu Wei Hu Shan in Chinese okay. for our Chinese viewers. If you Google it, it's kind of hard because there's lots of other things that have used that name because it's so famous. So mm -hmm. there's like a experimental music album <laughs> yeah. called Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy. There's um, a modern Hong Kong movie, 2014. Yeah. But it all goes back to the Cultural Revolution where basically um, Mao kind of decided that the Communist Party, the Communist Revolution had not been complete no. or that essentially it had backslid it had regressed and that in order it need there needed to be a permanent revolution everybody had to constantly be revolutioning <laughs> <laughs> and in order to do that every individual had to be educated re-educated re re-educated and empowered to do the revolution upon china mm -hmm. um which mo usually was people under 30 right people in their Teenagers. Yeah, the next generation the who next has not generation. gone through the first revolution yes. has got to be brought on board. People who had no experience with the prior world who mm -hmm. were fresh, weren't, weren't tainted by it. And obviously, if you've seen any of other episodes, it was, it was terrible and traumatizing. Um, millions and millions of people were killed. There was all sorts of schemes that went on, industrial schemes, social schemes, political schemes that all essentially failed. And it almost destroyed china yeah um more the than the first 30 years of of people's republic of china yes we're talking about yeah um so but part of that though is that they felt like they needed to educate people um and they needed to, to teach people things and this goes way back since the beginning of the revolution um the communist party and the pla in china was big on entertainment um entertainment was always Wait, contrary to common belief yeah, contrary, <laughs> you might think communists aren't fun right it's all boring and gray it's all boring and and but that's soviet style that's soviet style it's not Mao style and that's maybe xi jinping style <laughs> but yeah. but Mao's Mao's communism it's like soviet communism is like old school republican party mm -hmm. right yeah. in, in the united states old school conservatives mao is like trump Mao's like, oh we're going to have rallies. Yeah. You know, we're going to, I'm going to make jokes. Mm -hmm. We're going to have fun. Yeah. You know, um, and. To my f favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite West Wing lines. To, what's that? How do you think communists got everyone to be communists? Yeah. Right. But, you know, yeah. Mao had some good lines and yeah. he understood the power of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And everywhere the Red Army went, there were performing units, there were singers, there were actors, there were troops, they put on plays. Um, when you started a revolutionary cadre somewhere in some village, just as much as guns, you know, they needed pamphlets, they needed scripts yeah. because rural China was a very boring place and there wasn't much to do. And if, some people might disagree with, I, but I mean, but I yeah, think countryside in general, especially at the time where, um, material goods, well, you know, economy was not so developed. Yes. It's but, not a, but I would argue that they got results, right? Mm -hmm. They would put on these shows, they yeah. would put on these plays. And people would come to see them mm -hmm. and absorb the political messages from them because they were entertainment, right? And it was they a were, source of entertainment in their hardworking days. Yeah, possibly dreary lives. Um, so I have a quote here from uh, Red Star Over China mm -hmm. by Edgar Snow, which is... My favorite book. Okay. I'm being sarcastic. I hate the book. Um, well, I want to do I want to do a discussion yeah. on it because Red, Red Star Over China was basically an American journalist went to China in the 1930s mm -hmm. um, when Mao was on the run yeah, and he snuck in past the anti-communist forces and basically, and he, and he met Mao, he met the people, he heard his story 
and he was very positive about Mao. Mm -hmm. He right? was very impressed. He's very impressed by Mao, and that book um, set off a whole generation of people who. Uh, that was a very excellent propaganda. Yeah, piece propaganda for Mao. piece. Like in modern times, this book is also being used as a propaganda piece, mm. as a proof of how Mao style or Chinese style communism is really is great. very influential and great. Yeah, and um, because Edgar Snow's yeah, very positive about it. And one of the things he writes about um, is these Chinese performing arts troops. And this is um, a bit of a, a summary, but these are a couple lines from it. There was no more powerful weapon of propaganda in the communist movement than the Reds' dramatic troops, and none more subtly manipulated. <laughs> when the Reds occupied new areas, it was the Red Theater that calmed the fears of the people, gave them rudimentary ideas of the Red program, and dispensed great quantities of revolutionary thought to win the people's confidence. During the 1935 Shanxi expedition, for example, hundreds of peasants heard about the red players with the army and flocked to see them. So, you know, they understand that, um, you know, the KMT, they're just trying to rule, right? Yeah. They don't necessarily need to get the peasants on board no. with any sort of ideological program. But as the communists... You know, they don't just need subjects, at least at this point. They need fervent people, right? They need, they need pe comrades. They, they need, need comrades. They need soldiers. They need revolutionaries. So you have to get the message out. And how you do that is you entertain people. And then they absorb the message through the entertainment. So that went on. And, you know, I continued basically, I mean, even to this day, right? China has lots of state media Lots of state-sponsored entertainment and, and programs and stuff. Yeah. But in the Cultural Revolution, you know, they're trying to get rid of everything old in China and replace it with new revolutionary things. So, for example, you know, we talked about they burned lots of old scrolls and books. They smashed temples. They smashed pots. Mm -hmm. They, you know, broke all these things. Yeah. And one of the things on the target list was Beijing Opera, which... Yeah you know, is um, very old art, fancy costumes, lots of singing and high-pitched voices. Lots of screeching. Screeching. I can say that I'm Chinese. <laughs> lots of cymbals and bells. and. I'm, I think Beijing Opera is pretty famous. Yeah, worldwide. right. It's, it's, yeah. it's pretty unique. And But what they thought during the Cultural Revolution was, okay, well, maybe instead of just getting rid of the Beijing Opera, we can turn it into a tool for communism. And the person who spearheaded this was Jiang Qing, who was Mao's wife, who was an actress in her youth, was big into arts, thought of herself as an artist. And so she took it upon herself to essentially sponsor the creation of what were the eight model plays or the eight model operas, yeah. which were eight revolutionary stories told in the format of a Beijing opera. Were they all Beijing operas or some of them were just I stage plays? I think some of them were just stage plays. Mm. Um, and also apparently the more popular ones. So I don't, this is something I don't know mu this much about, but apparently along with Beijing operas, other regions of China have their own similar yeah. theatrical things that are similar. There are different styles of plays. Different styles stage of operas. Arts and yes. And they would remake them in the different regions to yeah. fit those um those um, art types yeah these official operas are called yang banxi which is a is a thing of its time mm. and what you know revolutionary what, it, operas basically. yes exactly and what was is, uh, direct translation would be like sample place mm. and that was sort of the only thing that was allowed to be uh, to go around to be performed around the country to be spread around the country at the time. Yes. Yeah. And there were, after the revolution, you know, people, with the benefit of hindsight, people think that, um, you know, everything Mao took over, everything in China was suddenly locked down and communist, which isn't really true. Things like Beijing opera and plays and things we would consider as bourgeoisie went on in China yeah. after the revolution. Yeah. And it really wasn't until the Cultural Revolution that everything that's firmly... That's why he needed a Cultural Revolution. Yeah, that's why he needed the Cultural Revolution. <laughs> it wasn't permanent. <laughs> no. Because um, people like entertainment, right? Bread and circuses. Yeah, bread and circuses. There was a lack of bread to go around during those years. So you got to have the circuses. <laughs> you got to have the circuses. <laughs> the great leap forward is happening. So yeah. you got to make up for, for not enough bread. But taking Tiger Mountain by strategy... We'll talk more about where it came from at the end. It was based off of a book written by a guy who was a soldier 
the People's Liberation Army. Yeah. Time went on and they decided to use it as one of these um, stories. And it was a play first or, you know, Beijing opera first, and then they filmed it. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the plot and we're going to talk about, I guess, our impressions of what this is supposed to teach people because beyond just being a piece of entertainment, this is supposed to go out beyond the movie version. There would have been local productions of this everywhere in China. Yeah. You would have schools do it. You would have party cadres do it. There was performing groups in the People's Liberation Army. Yeah. In a society that did not have widespread, in many areas, uh, electricity. You couldn't have radios. Mm -hmm. um, this was how rural people would get the message. Yeah, they of, traveled around and played out. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so... So it starts off with a bunch of communists marching in the snow. It's supposed to be set in 1946. So the Japanese have been defeated. And now it's this Chinese Civil War. And it's set in Manchuria. Northern China northern, at this point. Northern China, right? Yeah. Japanese are gone. Yeah, Japanese are gone. And it's between these fresh-faced, shining, beaming PLA soldiers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the... Uh, Oh. These, these bandits that are affiliated with the nationalists, the KMT. Yeah. It's unclear if they're actually affiliated with the KMT, but... They're loosely affiliated. They're not an official part of it, but I think they were about to become an official part of the K, uh, KMT military. Yeah, the, KM, the KMT is sort of interesting in that if you said you were part of the KMT, for the most part, Chiang Kai-shek was happy to have you. Yeah. Right? And if you could control an area and say you're a part of the KMT... He'd rather have that than if you're like a communist. And obviously that yeah. caused problems because theoretically he controlled large parts of China. But in reality, a lot of them... It was a warlord militia sort of a system. Yeah. And if things were going badly, they would Yeah. He was like the king him. of kings. Yes. He wasn't the president. <laughs> no. Communist is marching in the snow. And you get right off the bat, and I, I will admit that uh, so i don't speak chinese beyond a couple words this movie despite its popularity it was played um the average the statistic i saw is an average of 10 times per village per year <laughs> during the cultural revolution and there's a lot of villages in china a lot of villages um and if you didn't go to these things then people would suspect that you have would have some sort of anti-communist leanings <laughs> right yeah, yeah, if yeah. you weren't enthusiastically going to these things and cheering yeah so lots of people went to it. Um, but we couldn't find an English translation. I couldn't translation. find an English translation. But I did find some enterprising, probably um, communist college professor from the 1970s. Communist co 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 Tran college professors who Trans study tr co communism? Yeah. Okay. Transcribed the, the play. Yeah. So I just, I read the script and I watched the play at the same time. But it's very political. And so they stop in the snow. And this is an example of some of the dialogue. So um, well, the regiment, the regiment party committee sent us as a pursuit detachment into the snowy forest in accordance with Chairman Mao's directive. Build stable base areas in the northeast. Our job is to arouse the masses in the in the Mutong Chang area, wipe out the bandits, consolidate the rear, coordinate with our field army and smash the U.S. U.S. backed Guomindang attacks. It's a task of great strategic importance. That vulture, who's the, the villain, the bandit, yeah. and his diehards gang have hidden themselves deep in the mountains. We've been trudging through the snow for days, but there's no sign of them. We must display our style of continuous fighting. Be resolute, fear no sacrifice, and surmount every difficulty to win victory. Mm. So obviously that's straight out of a political pamphlet. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. And this was heavily, this was adapted from a book, mm -hmm. but the, the, the script that you are reading is going to be edited many many times to have a very focused political message yes yeah so because they oh. know every single person in china yeah is going to hear these words yeah so it better be the real correct. sharp and the correct <laughs> version of mao's words yes right and um there is a chinese version of the the play itself mm -hmm. is um on youtube and i think it's been many years and i don't i don't know about copyrights it's probably stuff, but copyright. but yeah if you know Chinese, I would recommend go on YouTube and search for it. Um, it's very entertaining to watch. And you do get the impression a bit that it's sort of like eat your dinner and then you get your dessert. Yeah. Okay. There's there's periods of long monologue oh, where yeah. they explain the communist policies and then they do some singing and some dancing yeah. and maybe some fighting. Yeah. So, you know, you got to sit through that. Yeah. Uh, for example, the last, we'll talk about it, but the last like 
10 minutes of the movie is one long dance fight scene, which is probably the part people like the most. Yeah, maybe, yeah, probably. And, but that's at the very end. So you got to sit through all the propaganda. Yeah. So we have all these little hero communist soldiers. They're here right in the snow to, um, uh, to save China, to fight the vulture. So we meet the bandits, who are the KMT. And their costume design is they look like they're like orcs in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. They have, they have like blue lights shining on them. Mm-hmm. They're all raggedy. They have like hair glued all over their faces like yeah. they're demons or something. Yeah. And there's some sort of map they're looking for that will let them take over the region. It doesn't really make sense. There, there's some map they're looking for. It doesn't really matter what the map's for. Yeah. And they talk about how the Americans are helping Chiang Kai-shek. And once communism is defeated, the vulture is going to rule all of northern China. As the warlord. As the warlord. The local warlord Mm -hmm. that's working with KMT. Yeah. They go to um, terrorize a local village. And even the the bandit leader, the vulture's followers are like, maybe we shouldn't terrorize that village. We're right next to it. We want them to like us. And he's Mm -hmm. like, no, we're going to (laughs) terrorize every village. (laughs) (laughs) And they go and they like kidnap people to work for them. Uh, The bandits kill some people. They grab this lady's baby and dramatically throw it off a cliff for apparently no reason. Yeah. Uh, which actually seems to be a a trend in Chinese stories, throwing babies off things. Liu Bei does it. Mm. I think I've seen it a couple other Chinese stories. People dramatically throwing babies off things. Uh, and, and Lu, Lu it's Bei, a grand gesture. Yeah, Liu Lu, Bei is the um, Liu Bei. Liu Bei is the kind of like I one guess, of the Three Kingdoms leader he, of the three hero kingdoms. characters in Three Kingdoms. Yeah, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, uh, and he really launches that baby. And then, you know, we get some songs, people get killed in the village about how tough their life is under these bandits and how China is a terrible place. So then the next scene is we meet some hunters in the mountains. They're getting ready to escape the area, presumably because of bandits. One is uh, this older guy, another is this young girl in disguise as a man, presumably because she's afraid of being assaulted by bandits. These bandits. By these bandits. These bandits are all things evil. Yes, all things evil. They're the plague of China. Yeah. Um, so then the PLA soldiers, the scouts approach them and they're initially afraid because they go, these are more bandits. Yeah. Right. And then in rather direct terms, the PLA has to, has to like, no, we're the people's liberation army. And they're like, sure you are, (laughs) you know, whatever. They're very, just say it. Yeah. They're they're very dismissive of it. They're like everybody, you know, they're distract, they distrust, they distrust like, you know, any sort of military forces or, yes. or people of power. Men with guns marching around. Yeah. And they talk about how sometimes bandits will claim their People's Liberation Army <laughs> soldiers. Yeah. And I think that is a, that is a sort of a defense of, so, I mean, there was lots of communist bandits in China, right? The, yeah. the line between a communist revolutionary in the early days yeah. and a bandit is was very blurry was very blurry right also at this time yeah. china's official government was the kmt yes the the the, the people's liberation army so by one definition they call themselves that they're all bandits yeah. yeah 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 they're the rebel forces yes officially speaking even now if you um so for example there is some sort of database i forget what it is of all of the martyrs of the revolution or whatever in in china all mm-hmm. the all the people who were in the pla or supposedly fought for it and if you challenge if any of these people were actually bandits yeah right then you basically get oh boy are we gonna talk about that in a second well i have a we, surprise for you okay well, exactly <laughs> that <laughs> yeah right so if you if you talk so keep it, listening <laughs> yeah so if you if you you know say like if any of these people were not actually pure communist crusaders who mm-hmm followed Mao's three principles and never from the very beginning took of anything days. from any peasants, you know, or ever did anything bad. Yeah. You basically get blackballed by, mm-hmm. by uh, the government. But anyway, so, um, but no, those people are all fake PLA. Anybody who you thought was a bandit was, was, was fake, fake, fake yeah. PLA. So anyway, um, the PLA says, you know, they need their help, how great Mao is, how we're different. We're the real communists. You can trust us. We're going to make your lives better. But these these people, these hunters in the mountains, they've been burned too many times. Yeah. And they're like, no, we can't trust you. But eventually, the hero, whose name is Yang, he essentially radicalizes them. Yeah. You know, like it almost makes me think of, uh, you know, like a like a cult or terrorist organization, <laughs> right? You radicalize them 
And now they're, by the end of the conversation, they're essentially ready to die for communism. Yeah, I think radicalized is the right word. Right, because you, you need... It, it doesn't takes, have to be a negative thing, or not in this case, yeah. a positive thing either. Well, but it maybe it's a positive thing in general, a negative thing in general. It's, it's shown as a positive thing within the context of the movie. Oh, yeah, no, that's what I meant. And it's it the movie does show that the play, mm -hmm. the play does go into detail and it's very in line with what i've learned throughout the years in school and i've seen on screen in china the official line of how no, no like works. how how they supposedly uh, convince these very distru distrusting suffering people of china right yeah. who has spent a lifetime in um, despair they mm -hmm. bring them food there's always unlimited amount of food to <laughs> gift to these peasants yes i always wonder. you're not saying this is what they actually did but this is what no, you this were is taught the, this is what what i was taught and exactly what was portrayed in this movie mm -hmm. Very, like line by line yeah and they always give bags of like rice i said like grains mm -hmm. to villagers no idea where they came from because these are Another soldiers <laughs> they're not farmers right yeah. so if all of china is in despair <laughs> <laughs> did you did you steal that from Shanghai or like I don't know you know who knows the, but there's always food to give away they always there's always a uh, a nurse or a doctor that's you know that's with the unit <laughs> that goes around and treat everyone in the village and cures them all mm -hmm. um, I mean I'm not saying that hasn't didn't happen you know um, military units have military forces have doctors yes um, they could go around and help people but, but that's that's the that's what we do everywhere but but and, this is um. And no, and they go into the houses, they clean the houses for them, they do housework, they cook dinners, <laughs> they just go around and do all these uh, menial tasks. Menial ta it's like they're campaigning. They're well, doing grassroots campaigning. So, but here's the thing, right? Yeah. Even if they didn't do that in real life, in mm -hmm. a way, this is campaigning, right? This yeah. is no, this is saying that they did it is yes. campaigning. This is like saying we're, we're proving that we deserve to be in yeah, charge of China. Like we're saying this is how we want China. Yes. And it's a hundred percent. We deserve it. We deserve it. And by the end, he's like, I'll help you track down some of the bandits. Yeah. Right? And they find like the secret map that the vulture's looking for, but it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> so scene four, <laughs> we go back to the, to the People's Liberation Army headquarters. There's some singing. The, the leader of the PLA forces, they interrogate one of the bandits, give some more um, politician, give some more politics. He mm. says... Uh, the rev long ago, the long ago, Chairman Mao told us the Revolutionary War is a war of the masses. It can be waged only by mobilizing the masses and relying on them. Without the masses, we can't move a step. When you say that, it's sort of like with the benefit of hindsight. If you're some remote village who is being told you're communist now, yeah, right? You go, oh well, everybody followed them because. Mao said, you know what I mean? It's like, well, they wouldn't have won if everybody wasn't following. So even yeah. if you've never seen other parts of China, yeah. you accept that it's true. Like, oh, yeah. I guess everybody else in China. Yeah. Also, in a way that, because this is during the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. and this is during the Cultural Revolution, they were telling a story of how the communists had won China. Yes. Right? And it, in a way, makes the people in the village watching this feel like they're part of it. Well, also, because it's the Cultural Revolution, it's like, well, we need to re-win China. Yeah, we need to re-win. Uh, you... You, one of these people, that Mao. exactly what we're talking about yeah. in this movie. Yes. You are part of the movement. Yes. And even though you might have missed the original movement. Because <laughs> you, you were born too late. Yeah, yeah. Now you can be part of <laughs> now this Now it's one. your opportunity. <laughs> to go. <laughs> to save China yet again. <laughs> to go beat a factory owner to death. Um, yeah. Right. So they interrogate Luan Ping, who's the former bandit leader. And again, the, the bandits have this weird mix of costumes where they're, <laughs> it's like some of them are dressed like KMT some of them are dressed almost like like Japanese or, or fascists. Yeah. Some of them are dressed like imperial officials. I think the idea is that they took these, like these are a, a, a stereotypes, a or, motley or, crew of people. <laughs> Everything that's bad about China. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then that these are the these are the vultures' um, henchmen. Yeah. So he's all hunched over. He tries to fool him about the map, which again I don't understand the map, but so. Um, and they basically almost do a struggle session with him. And a struggle session is during the Cultural Revolution where you bring somebody in and you accuse them of being anti-revolutionary, either because you know their parents were landlords, they studied at a foreign school, whatever, they didn't clap enough during Chairman Mao's speech. Mm -hmm. And you basically 
you you hit them and you make them keep accusing and you'll, you'll feel better if you confess and you know, it, people, it's a public torture public torture people would die during these they have to wear boards and but anyway so he they interrogate him and they keep telling him to confess he says leniency to those who confess severity to those who resist and eventually <laughs> yeah um Wong Ping tells them about what the map is for they're trying to decide what to do about tiger mountain mm. how to attack it and i guess the map has positions on it or something that's important but they go we could just take tiger mountain we could just attack it Mm -hmm. because we're stronger than they are Mm. because we're obviously the pla and we're so strong but we're not gonna do that because we're too strong and if you (laughs) try and punch a fly the fly will fly away so we need to take it they'll just escape they'll just escape so we need to take it by strategy i mean it it does make sense it it, from the movie plot perspective because the uh the vulture leader Mm -hmm. was known to be elusive (laughs) no it it is they made a point that he was very elusive he would he has all these tunnels he can just escape and then once you leave uh they will just come back and yes you know so you you gotta get them so we gotta get them so he says, uh, we must remember what Chairman Mal tells us. Strategically, <laughs> we should despise our enemy, but tactically, we should take him seriously. Yeah. <laughs> comrade Tonhua, please call another democratic meeting of the comrades and talk it over again in the light of the latest developments. <laughs> this is that famously democratic <laughs> yes. People's Liberation Army. One people, one person, one vote. That's yeah. how we work. That's how it's to this day. To this day. Uh, yeah. Though that is a bit unfair. I mean, I'm sure there was more... Um, lower down decision making in the early days and like the PLA and stuff. One thing that what you just said. But at least they're, they're implying there was. They're impl- yeah, well, it's a propaganda. Yes. But, but it's the image they're trying to present. But like what you said, though, like every 10 minutes through these plot points and singing. Yeah. Um, every, it's like there's a timer. Yeah. Like every five to 10 minutes they go, we haven't m- mentioned Chairman Mao yet. And we got to talk about him. We got to talk about him again. Yes. Yeah. The plan is they decide to send Yang, who's kind of the hero, to infiltrate the bandits, which I guess he's done before. And because he's a peasant and he's from sort of the region, he understands how to talk to the bandits. Yeah. Though he really is like quite the hero character, as we'll see. It's not really explained why he is quite so adept at sneaking into places, but he's going <laughs> to he sneak is. in. He's going to convince the bandits he's one of them. Yeah. And then he's going to get the defenses of yeah, the village. He's sort of the pr- protagonist yes. of the show. There's this upcoming event called the Hundred Chickens Feast, which is <laughs> Bai Ji Yan. <laughs> where the bandits yeah. have a feast on the vulture's birthday yeah. of a hundred chickens that they've stolen from a hundred hundred different families. <laughs> it's not just a hundred chickens. No. It's a hundred chickens from a hundred different families because they are exploiting the whole community around yes. them. Everyone is a victim. And they have to be that cruel. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, okay, well that's coming up in the spring, so we'll We'll send him in, he'll get the stuff, and then we'll attack on the spring. Yeah. So scene five, Yang goes to meet with the bandits. He shoots a tiger, does a lot of dancing, and convinces them that he's one of them. The bandits still look like RPG monsters. Mm-hmm. Scene six, Yang goes to the bandit camp. It's like it's like it's like a cave with no lighting. <laughs> it's like these people are like bats. Instead yeah, like, of like bats. Like, like, like instead of like little uh, militias. Yeah. Go- gorilla fighters. Little gorilla fighters. They're living in this big rock cave and the vulture's sitting on this throne. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever Yang walks around and he's wearing this really sweet like tiger vest. Yeah. Like it's tiger a tiger skin, skin vest. And like this tiger skin hat. I think his boots are tiger skin. Yeah. It, <laughs> It's, it's, it's quite, he's all dolled up. It's, it's quite striking. None of the other bandits look like that. They no. all look like they've been rolling around in the dirt. No, the bandits don't look like they're rich or anything. No. They, they look, don't look like they're living a, living their life, exploiting, stealing wealth from all the people around I think, it. I think that's the implication of like, they're doing this and they're still miserable, right? Mm. They could just be the, the PLA. And Yang always has a light on him. He's walking around. So there's all this back and forth. The vulture is sitting on this throne. Uh, one small thing is they're talking about how one of the KMT generals is in possession of a Japanese sword given to him by the Japanese. Mm. So they're not so subtle implication that the KMT are the, in bed with the Japanese. Are in bed with the, the Japanese. KMT was the leading. Yeah, even yeah, though we don't, they yeah, were the it's, ones fighting the Japanese. Yeah. But, you know, like all the bad people together again in this camp. Yes. It's just this a, a group shorthand for everything bad about China. right? All the sufferings of the all, No, all the opposite, uh, opposite party. To um, communism. To communism, yeah. So Yang chums it up with the vulture, gives them the secret map, and, you know, is declared like a sworn brother or whatever. They accept him as one of their own. One of their own. So we go back to the peasant village from earlier, the one where the guy threw the baby off the cliff. The People's Liberation Army arrives, 
And again, everyone has been so ravaged by Bannis that they don't trust him. Yeah. But like you said, Cherry, they go around, they make soup for people. They, you know, give you bags of rice, give you bags of rice. They, you know, there's medics and eventually they convince. And this, um, the, uh, <laughs> the guy whose baby got thrown over the cliff and his wife died. He gives this almost like, I dreamed the dream song Speech, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where he's like, I never dreamed this like day would come where there's, you know, good soldiers of China and they're yeah. here and, and they're, they're us, right? They're peasants like us and yeah. we're all on the same side. So, yes. well, they do make a point when they go, oh, like, don't do all these housework. It's a lot. Right. And they go, no, no, all of these, all of our soldiers, they all came from like peasant upbringings. Yes. They you can for- trust us. <laughs> yes, we haven't forgotten. I'm, I'm sure the KMT came from peasants too, right? No, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they haven't forgotten their class consciousness. No. The, Are we going to talk about the train? Well, yeah, we're going to talk about okay. the train. So, but basically, they, they radicalize the village like they radicalize the, hun- the hunters. You mean they bring them on board to they the right bring them side on board of history. To the right side of history. They, they, they awaken their class consciousness. Yeah into the spirit of revolution. So they need they need food and winter clothing though cuz they go you guys are too scrawny to, to fight, <laughs> right? We have gu- we have guns, but yeah. you guys need food. Yeah. So they have this elaborate plan which is interesting where they go, well, what we'll do is we'll fix the railroad. We'll build a We'll railroad. build the railroad to the village. Mm-hmm. You'll pick medicinal herbs in the mountains. Yeah. Then you'll trade them for food and clothing. Yeah. It's all very capitalistic yeah. in a way yeah and i think that's supposed to represent that oh not only does is are we just soldiers but we're also bringing civilization yeah to these rural areas and yeah. we're bringing we're linking them into the economy yeah which we're about to they're, destroy they're like the saviors <laughs> right they're yes. save, communist saviors of these rural villages yes and because it's not just about if you ever if any of you have ever seen any of you the audience seen the movie seven samurai the whole thing with that movie is it's a Japanese movie where a village is going to get attacked by bandits. They hire samurai. The samurai train them. They kill the bandits. The samurai leave. But nothing really changes, Mm-mm. right? It's just a cyclical thing. And if the bandits come again next year, nothing will change. But the whole point of this is not only are they going to take out the bandits, but they're going to modernize this village. It's not just that it's going to be free of the threat. It's going to be that it's improved. What, what what did we say? A permanent revolution? A new China? Yeah. Yeah. That's the message. That's the message. Yeah. Also, there's no mentioning of like any engineers. I don't know where <laughs> they get steel for the for the railroad, but they're like, we're going to build a railroad like in this winter and then in spring. And then later in the movie, the railroad has been built. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's you know, there's a train, they're trading. Yeah, sure. It's all very, um, it's just that it's easy. all very fairy tale like. Yes. Yeah. But you know, there's a, th- it, that's the idea. Like you, you want these people in these poor villages watching to think, oh, that could be us. Yeah. We could have a, we could, they'll, the PLA is going to, yeah, as come. long as we follow the party, this could be us. Yeah. We're going to be all smiling with bags of rice. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. Yes. <laughs> they're all carrying on these big bags of rice. It's like, wow. Well, everywhere. Everyone, like they have these, yeah, that's, they're like gift bags. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ready, ready to be bestowed like um the pla it's upon like a, the upon the, the the peasants and and you know the farmers who are who are who are hungry <laughs> rice diplomacy exactly yang in scene eight yang gets the secret bandit information but the vulture is suspicious they won't let him leave there's this plot point about a like a, a vulture does a, a fake attack to see if yang will report it to yeah. see if he's a real they were kind of suspicious but yang is just so smart that yeah, he realizes he's so good it's fake. at this so they believe him at this point. They're yes. like buddies. He's a trusted person in the in the bandit camp. Also, he's a tiger hunter, so they're really yeah, they really a, respect him. He shot a tiger. Oh, if anybody's watching the scene where he shoots a tiger, which is a little bit earlier, he's doing this whole little dance with a stick. And I read in the script that he was supposed to be riding a horse. No, he was and riding I, a horse. And I did not understand. I thought like, okay, this is a movie. This is have you like, never seen dances where like they pretend like in in I like, just assume in musicals? For the, I assume for sh- the movie version they could get an actual horse <laughs> if they wanted to. I think they were playing this on a sort of a stage because there's like stage set up. Yeah, but he, he has like a stick and he's supposed to be on a horse. But anyway, yeah. he <laughs> he does a horse dance. Yeah, he was on a horse. He's on a horse. So it's spring. The villagers have made money selling herbs. They have food. They have clothing. They're ready to attack Tiger Mountain alongside yeah. the PLA. And it's basically everybody in the village. It's the men. It's the women. One thing about this movie is it is very um, 
they don't make a big deal about the fact that there's women soldiers in the PLA. It's just so natural. And that there's radicalized women soldiers in mm-hmm. the village. Yeah. Um, who've been radicalized by the PLA. Well, the, the woman, the yeah, the teenage girl we were talking about. Who was hiding her identity before. Yeah, as a boy. Mm-hmm. Um, she she completely transformed yes. into this blossoming young woman who is ready to become a comrade. <laughs> well, she is, who a, is com- a comrade. Yeah. Who's, who, who's became a comrade. Who in the final act yeah. is going gonna, is gonna to charge into the bandit fortress with a bayonet and stab people to death. Yes. So... I mean, you got to get half the population yeah. to be on board. The famous quote um, from Mao is, women hold up half the sky. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there were. that. This this isn't a um, a uh, anachronism. I mean, they the communists would quite happily give a woman a rifle in a village if she was going to oh, shoot well, a canteen yeah. for Well, them. we talked about this in the marriage episode. Yeah. Where sort of as a way to transform a society, but also like to bring... To, 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 to really make a grassroots movement, grassroots, mm-hmm. the uh, early stage communism in China really tried to bring women on board. Yeah. And, um, and they did so by, you know, um, abolishing like traditional laws of marriage, mm-hmm. right? And uh, making sure that fathers pay for <laughs> child care mm-hmm. everywhere, um, everywhere that communism was at. And a lot of women also would go into these performing troops. Yeah. Right? And spread the communist message that way. Yeah. Everyone radicalized. One of the prisoners escapes. The guy who got interrogated at the beginning to warn the vulture that the communists are about to attack. And that, and he gets there. He realizes that Yang is a communist. <laughs> and he tries to convince them. But Yang's, again, too smart. Yeah. And he convinces the vulture that Luan, Luan Ping. The real bandit. The real is... bandit is the traitor. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Yang just takes him outside and shoots him. In cold blood, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there right. is no trial. Yeah, there is in no the trial. times of communism revolution. Yeah, right. He's a landlord. He's a bandit. Yeah. They gave him one chance, Cherry. He ran away. Yeah. So he lost so his So he chance. deserves to die so, in this case. So Yang takes him off scene and shoots him. Then the communists sneak in without ever getting the map. So they basically follow... They follow I mean, they the, got the tra- map. They got the map. There's a plot that got the map. Where did they get the map from? They, no, they got the map from the guy. That's how. That's why he brought the map. Yang got brought the map to the. Well, how do you think Yang got the map? Yang brought the map to the bandits. Yeah, but they copied the map before oh, Yang they bring the map. The they map. made a. They're, okay, you okay. need to read okay. this. Okay, well, whatever. But, but delete that part. But the, no, no, I'm not deleting that's that. That's factually part. wrong. That's, that's fine. <laughs> but but what they do though is they follow the tracks of the guy who escaped through the snow sure yeah to figure out how he got in yeah and then because he knows the back entrances or whatever but anyway so they sneak in there's this really long fight scene which is actually pretty good and um some good action some good action lots of sword fights and bayonets and shooting people and then they kill everybody and then they all come together and they pose and the movie ends yeah a little abruptly right a quick ending i would say a, a quick ending so that's the that's the plot, and as you can see, you know it's nothing, nothing, uh, nothing earth shattering there. It's fairly simple because again, it's, it's this is for the the common people of of China to digest, right? It's not supposed to be a philosophical fight. philosophical work, right? It's, it's supposed not, to. It's not asking any philosophical questions. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's not asking prop- any questions. It's a propaganda piece. It's not asking any questions. Oh yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's 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 answering your questions, which is yes. Who are these communists? Why do they think they're in charge? Why should I listen to them? You know, and, you know. What does it mean to me? Wh- how this is movement. This, yeah. How is it different than just having an emperor? Yeah. Or, or the KMT? Yes. And so this is explaining it to them. And this is not obviously the first movie like it. These plays, things like it, um, dances, songs, you know, went back, like we talked about, to the beginning of the revolution. But this is... Um, the most famous one. This is the most famous one because this is at the point where the communists control everything. They have mass media. And it was the Cultural Revolution, which is, you know, perhaps the greatest, the cultural high point of of uh, communist propaganda. In Maoist intense, propaganda. Ma- Ma- Maoist propaganda in terms of intensity. So uh, I think Cherry has looked up some background yeah. to it. Well, um, there's a lot of... Even today in China, in the Chinese world, there's mm-hmm. a lot of material about this, right? Because it is a cultural phenomenon, mm-hmm. judged based on how, how prominent it was only like 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. But um, throughout researching, there's three people's faith. There are three people who sort of jumped out. Well, and yeah. one, 
so we talked about Breaking with Old Ideas. Yeah. Which is much more, which is an actual movie. This isn't really an actual movie. This is a, this is a, somebody filmed a stage production. Yeah. With a little, some special effects. And Breaking with Old Ideas is an actual movie. And I think Breaking Ideas was, is more entertaining. But in the same way, it never, it did not have the cultural impact of this. No. I think probably very few people, even in China, have probably seen Breaking with Old, <laughs> Breaking with old Ideas. Yeah, it's not a household yeah, it, known it, movie. This is like, nowadays. yeah, I mean, like, Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy is like, is like Snow White or Cinderella or you know aladdin or, or lion it's king or something of, it's a disney of the movie cultural revolution times. everybody sung the songs everybody knew it you know everybody knew the characters they could do they could do the dances so there's a lot more known well, i don't know if everyone could do the dances you know what i mean but <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a lot more known about it and the people involved than breaking with old ideas yes so well so there are three people their fate uh is tied to this movie mm-hmm. or this 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 story really right this piece of work <laughs> art yeah. This piece of art, propaganda art. Um, so the like you mentioned, it was a story adopted adapted from a fictional novel called um, Tracks in the Snowy Forest. In Chinese, it's called Linghai Xue Yuan. And it's written by Chinese writer Chu Bo. And this was his um, most uh, favorite book, but and it got instantly pretty popular in China. Um, and he wrote it in, um, I think, 1955. And, you know, it was right after New China had been established. Um, this book with stories like taking the taking of the Tiger Mountain um, really portrays the POA in a very positive light. Right? Yeah. It's a great propaganda piece for them, but a great propaganda for them. So um, a little bit about the writer to put things into perspective. He oh, I want to I want to actually say mm-hmm. briefly is like, and I think one reason why this is interesting, and again why all these things have to have to venerate the PLA is. In traditional Chinese Confucian culture, soldiers are not viewed, soldiering is not viewed as an honorable profession. Yeah, scholars are. Scholars are, and even farmers are viewed higher Mm -hmm. than, because you're creating something, right? You're creating a thing. Merchants are usually below farmers because they don't create anything by that mind. They just trade. Yeah. And soldiers are like the worst because they just (laughs) kill people. And yeah. You know, that mentality of like, you only be a soldier if you have to be if somebody kidnaps you and drags you into a unit. Yeah. I think was still around with like the KMT. And in your villages and stuff, you have to show that, no, no, these aren't thugs. These aren't bandits. They're revolutionaries. They're revolutionaries. They're comrades. They're peasants. They're peasants with guns, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have all the virtues of a peasant, um, but... But they're not- helping us to take our fate yes. upon ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so he, he was one of those mm-hmm. soldiers. He grew up uh, in a village, you know, in the countryside. He joined, back then it was called the 8th Root Army because it wasn't official then. They haven't taken China. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, he joined the POA basically uh, in 15, when he was 15 years old. And he, um, he fought against the Japanese invasion as part of the army. He fought in the Chinese Civil War. And um, he specifically fought in the northeast region of China where the story happened. So this book was sort of based on his real life experiences. And he obviously adapted into a novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 1949, he became a party official. Right. So he spent his life in the military and the party. Yeah. And um, but, but, you know, like looking at his life, you would think he's a model citizen of China. Yes. Of new China. However, <laughs> his times as a party official wasn't all that smooth. wasn't like his times in the military. I mean, he was injured in the military, but you know he had a pretty good, t- successful career. Well, in the in the in the, in the war chair, you only have to worry about people on the other side stabbing you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you so, don't have to worry about getting stabbed in the back. Yes. So in 1955, he uh, was working um, in a car factory as a as a party secretary. Mm-hmm. He was criticized for being against implementing of the system of one-man leadership which is a model from soviet union apparently from the time meaning that you know in a car factory there's one person likely either the party secretary or the factory manager who's going to be responsible for everything instead just of, like in china mao would be responsible for everything instead of having what like a like a committee i don't know union maybe okay. <laughs> yeah so he didn't like that and uh he was criticized um as being like on the right presumably by other people in the party yeah the oh, workers were probably like, yeah, great. Let us decide to do something. Yeah, some. but, you know, workers don't have a voice. <laughs> yeah. it's just, it's just no voice. 
I mean, we say that they have the voice, but yeah, try to organize a union in China today. Mm-hmm. See where you so yeah. this guy's so a see true, how far you can get. So this guy's a true a true believer. Uh, he will be one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, later on, he was reassigned to a different um, uh, factory. It's a steel rolling mill in Sichuan province. And during the big leap forward, the local government requested steel and other production materials from the factory that he managed. And he said, no, this is for the factory and everything needs to be accounted for. It's all in the books. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was, of course, um, criticized in the anti-rightist campaign in 1959 for sabotaging (laughs) the Great Leap Forward movement. That's a big hat to wear. Well, you know, it's interesting, though. I I think some of the people who do get caught up in this, Mm -hmm. they are the most they are some of the people with the best records because they think like no i don't have anything to hide of course i'm not a rightist right i yeah. fought in the revolution no, so, the, the so about, i'm just gonna be honest yeah and the thing about great leap forward <laughs> it's not based on honesty or facts <laughs> no. or 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 reasonable expectations or real production results yeah so anyone who believes in those stuff which you know ideally I mean, you do if you manage a factory it's basically an entire economy just lying and hoping they're not the ones who get getting the sh- caught shit up can. in the lie yeah <laughs> yeah then people high up because this is like the second time probably mm-hmm. there's some smaller times you know that have, have, have happened in between but you know this is not the first time he has gotten into trouble so people high up in beijing had heard of this and they said you know what he's written some good stuff for the military mm-hmm. you know and he's a g- good old pa- party man right yeah so you know let's move him back you know he, he will stop making him to go to factories and get criticized for being like the writers and doing things the wrong way we'll keep him out of trouble yeah so they got him a job at the central political and cultural department in beijing and his job was just you know right okay he, he became a writer for the party right can get into much more trouble after that mm-hmm. you would think <laughs> there comes the cultural revolution i'm sorry because every <laughs> every episode we do yeah about this history period yeah, goes, then like, comes the culture revolution yeah, because you follow everyone's fate right yeah. and you see how they've done throughout first greatly forward and Which, then the rightist campaign and then the cultural revolution it's, it's the very it's, definition of the 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 nail that sticks up gets hammered down and yeah. that like if you are notable enough to be noticed yeah you're a target in the cultural revolution yeah right? right even if you've only done good stuff yes so he had four big hats on which every anti-revolutionary during the cultural revolution did and um he was a capital capitalist rotor a revisionist <laughs> he was a participant in literacy and artistic reactionary line which was a thing that I could not even understand in Chinese. But basically, it's to say, like, people who work in literacy in an artistic field. Yeah. An actor, if Ma's wife hated her, um, <laughs> if she's younger and prettier. I am a feminist, by the way. This is not me, like, trashing woman. But, um, yeah. I mean, Mao's wife was not a great person. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Women can be not for great. For another people. whole episode. Yeah. Whole you, other you can episode. be a woman and also be a not great person. Yeah. And so, but basically this is the group of people like who working like writers, performers, artists, work, you know, artists yeah. who are, are not necessarily intellectuals. Yeah. yeah. Who are not necessarily, who are anti-revolutionary. Yeah. So by some what, definition. By, by whatever definition it yeah. is. He was also one of the cow demons and snake spirits. So, th- <laughs> so this is an old Chinese saying. It's basically saying like Satanist monsters, devils. Okay. Like in the Chinese sense. So he's saying like he's like a like a wizard. He's no, he's cow demons and snake spirits. So like Niu Gui Shu Shen, like yeah, sure a wizard. You have some weird he, magical evil power. Okay, wow. Yeah, but like that's how you brand people in Cultural Revolution. It's very dehumanizing, which yeah. is the point. And so at this time, though, he also just finished a book right before the Cultural Revolution. It was about to be published. The book called Chao Long Biao. A name, the name of the main character. It's a tale of a patriot, patriotic hero, basically like a local bandit, who, okay. <laughs> who, who, who's very legendary, who's very good at fighting, who didn't want to be affiliated with anything. So he wasn't on the communist side. He wasn't on the KMT side. But he later on, throughout much struggles and a lot of legends, um, he was later enlisted into the communist forces uh, during the war against Japanese, but okay. not after some struggles. Mm. And this was seen as a big poisonous weed, apparently, because, you know, if we have a story where there's a hero character who is not one of the party members, who was not part of the POA. Yeah, because the whole the whole idea of the of these stories is that once you are presented mm-hmm. with the actual communism, 
right, with the actual Maoism. Once the PLA arrives in your village, once they explain it to you, you either are one of two things. You either wholeheartedly accept it and believe it immediately. Yeah. And are and are absorbed into it. Yeah. Or if you have any reservations at all, you're you're anti revolutionary yes. and you're a reactionary. You can't be a positive person. No, there's no gray area. There's no gray area, right? Yeah. So how dare you tell a story about this? <laughs> yeah. So that was bad news. And, you know, it obviously it was about to, it was going to get published. It was printed. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no. So it was canned and it wasn't published until like 10 or so years after. Anyways, during Cultural Revolution, he was in jail at one point. Mm -hmm. He was assigned a job as a janitor at one point. And be, later, on, later on, because he had disabilities during the war, like he couldn't walk right because of injuries from the war, he was allowed to work in a communion kitchen which was a big mercy yeah. that they had, you know. Yeah, so um, so that's his fate. And later on, during the culture, when they decided, okay, you know what? This is a really pe a good piece of propaganda. <laughs> they took him out of jail to work on this. On the, <laughs> work on on the, the script screenplay. for the movie. Yeah. And the second person whose fate also is tied to this movie mm -hmm. is the actor who played the main protagonist, Yang, Yang Zerong, of the movie. You know, the, the, the guy who... Um, sneaks into the bandit camp, in, wears yeah. his little tiger outfit. Yes. Um, does lots of sword fighting and dancing. Right? Yeah. So he was played by actor uh, Tong Xiangling, who grew up in a family of Beijing opera performers. Mm -mm -mm. And he was... Yeah, he was very famous because he was very Bad good. Bad revolutionary pedigree right I know. there. He was one of the top performers at the time. Um, and of course, that also means he's anti-revolutionary. When Cultural Revolution comes around the corner. Well, yeah, he does a, he's an artist in a uh, reactionary form of media, Cherry. Yes, right? So he got the job first to play this character. However, they took the job back because, uh, you know, he has bad um, records. Yeah. You know, he's anti-revolutionary. How could you, how could you do that? Mm -hmm. How could you have him play it? Play a hero. Why don't we just, ha why don't we have a peasant do it? Right? Uh, and then they couldn't find anyone good <laughs> to play it. Because you know what? Beijing Opera... Uh, traditional Chinese art, uh, not that big of a field of talents. <laughs> you know what I mean? And also, like, you know, you, it requires a lot of practice, right? I mean, the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. everything was, like, happening. I'm snapping my fingers. But everything was happening, like, so quickly. Yeah. So it's not like, well, it's not like you can just train somebody for two years to learn the role. No, right? you can train anyone for Beijing Opera for two years. I know. So you, you It's you, like making sushi rice. Oh, yeah. But, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Even to have somebody be bad at it, right? You oh, need, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need... So, and if you watch the movie, you know, some of these cuts, you know, it's like it's like 10 or 15 minutes of dancing and singing and stuff, right? It's not... Yeah. It's not simple. Oh, those are professionals. Yes. The, po the, the propaganda aside, yes. there was a lot of... Uh, uh, decent performing yes in the movie I and mean, you really need to be able to sing it'd be like if you were trying it. to put on a production of um you know like cats or something you know i don't know hamilton mm -hmm. and you're just like you're just grabbing random people yeah i can't do that yeah also most beijing opera performers at this time are probably anti-revolutionary so it's not like they have a you know a pool of peasant performance to choose from yeah so anyways they couldn't find anyone good and also, you need someone young of a specific look. This is the protagonist of yeah. the movie. So they called him back and told him that this would be an opportunity for him to redeem himself playing this role. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, he took the job, right? Um, otherwise, he would probably be in jail or getting struggle session every yeah. day. I don't know. So <laughs> during, the, during the, the shooting of the movie, he was routinely hazed. In many scenes where he's the only one who does the singing, which he does most of the singing in the movie, mm -hmm. um, they would do it. Oh, they would reshoot it again and and again and again until he like just so tired and out of it. And he again, he's the only one doing all the you know all the singing. And um, he had besides playing the main character, being the star of the show, being the star of the show, he had to do dishes <laughs> of every meal of everyone on set. And there's more than two hundred people. So he wrote in his, like, he later wrote a book, of course, after the Cultural Revolution, um, detailing his experience making this movie. And he was, you know, he, every, after every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, he had to do more than 200 people's dishes. And then he'd go act. <laughs> and, then, and then he'd go back and do the dishes again. So that was his life. Yeah, well, he making had to movie. do that if he didn't want to get killed, probably. So Right? Making I mean, this even movie. then, though, right? I mean, he, by many people in the Cultural Revolution, he got off easy. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. When, right? when I say like, okay, I made it sound like the worst thing in the world to do, to, <laughs> to do dishes. I mean, a restaurant worker can do uh, 600 people's dishes a day, right? Yes. It's not, it's not literally torturing. Yes. It's not physical, like torturing. Uh, 
yeah, in a sense. Yes. But but it's very petty. It's it, well, a it's very petty, but b considering he's also they also hazed him during the shooting, mm -hmm. it was probably not a good experience. And they and, need him. And they well, no, he doesn't. They don't need him. He <laughs> needs them. He needs to redeem himself. Yeah, that's true. Right. I forgot so, about that. Sure. Yes. So while we're entertained, while we're being entertained about this by this movie and all of these people who are watching it, right? Like who have not are watching, no one's watching it today, but mm -hmm. people who were watching it everywhere in China at the time, and it's so dehumanizing. This, in a way, is being used for something that the end result is bad. You have... Cultural revolution, yes. Yeah, Great Leap Forward, Cultural Revolution, Communist Oppression, all these things. But the interesting thing is about it, though, is the actual content of the propaganda. Mm -hmm. There's not really much objectionable about it. No. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. we're building railroads, we're improving people's lives, we're fighting bandits who are stealing 100 chickens from every family, right? We're feeding people, we're, we're doing all these things. And let's forget about the fact that just about... Uh, 15, 18 years ago, thousands and thousands of people who died because, uh, because of great, to great leap forward. Yeah, Mao doesn't know how to organize an economy. So it is, it is very, you know, you have to keep in context of this. It's, it's so positive mm -hmm. and so, I guess, wholesome in a way. Yeah. Although Yang executes that guy in, in cold blood for something that was... That's wholesome by communist standards. Well, for, ma for something that was made in support of a regime that crushed so many people and even the people making it the guy who wrote the book yeah. life, life was destroyed the actor right whose life was destroyed yeah. <laughs> by the cultural revolution mm -hmm. so it's just it's strange that you get such a positive well, thing also, out of so much misery the story itself the book itself was not about the cultural revolution no it's, the, the, it's it was the about the, it was about the chinese civil war it was yes. about two different visions of China. Yeah. And like we said, he's, you know, like there were true believers who believed that communism was the way to go. Mm -hmm. And whether that's, rea you know, like a uh, realistic or not, but, but it was the sort of the fight between like a nationalist bourgeoisie, like city elites, right. Who, who fights against peasants that that's yeah. sort of what a lot of these people were fighting for. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want, I mean, and again, it, uh, he wanted they, a factory they, where everything's on the books yeah. instead of the Great Leap Forward. Right? Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, he didn't want the guy who wrote the the book, the tracks on snow or whatever. Yeah. He didn't. He he didn't want China with another emperor. No, right. He wanted a new society. Yeah, and I think it's it's sad that that's not what he got, and it took him a while to realize that's not what he had. Right. Yes, and so that's you know that's a, it's a weird situation where you a lot of people who did fight for it. And in a way, do you blame them? Do you blame them had, you know, in a way contributed to the Cultural Revolution because they had fought over a new China and new China came and yes. it was not a... No, when... It was a dictatorship. No, <laughs> was, when, when yeah. somebody like, you know, I don't know, Peng Dehuai or somebody, or some Chinese general yeah. is, is, is fighting for the, the Chinese Civil War, in their mind, they're not thinking about like, I'm doing this for the cultural revolution that's going to happen in 20 years. I'm doing it for the great leap forward. Yeah, they right? weren't. They, they think it's going to be better. They think it, yeah. we're not going to have those kind of mass famines and yes. things because we're going to have a better system. Yes. So So speaking, though, of, of, of modern day, <laughs> of the results. Yeah, so the third person whose life, <laughs> um, is, this was a surprise um, because, well, okay, I'll get into it. In 2015, a video was leaked in which um, this famous Chinese TV host, Bi Fujian, uh, was doing a, <laughs> was criticizing Chairman Mao. Um, was uh, making fun of him, basically. Making fun of Chairman Mao um, at a banquet table. Mm -hmm. And someone shot a video of it. Uh, it was about a minute long and it got leaked. It um, got very trendy on the internet. And um, so Bi Fujian, I mean, anyone outside China probably won't know him, but he is a household name in China at the time. And he was, uh, you know, he was one of the several hosts of, you know, the, the Chinese New Year Gala that happens every year that millions and millions of people watch. Hundreds of millions. Yeah. And so, you know, he faces on TV every day, mm -hmm. basically. Or was. Was on, <laughs> he face was on TV every day. <laughs> Until he made a joke about Mao. Until he made a joke about Mao. And, um, and it was such a big thing. But how he made fun, you know, he mocked Mao, our great Chairman Mao, was that he did a parody of taking the Tiger Mountains. <laughs> he sang some lines from it, and um, in between, he dropped in some little snarky comments, huh. right? About how, like, this wasn't true, or like, you mm -hmm. know, we really suffered a lot, you know? And um, 
the, the, the significance of this is that Bi Fujian, he is like about the age of our parents' generation, the generation that grew up during Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. the or, very or kids during it. Yeah, kids during it. Like, you know, you know, like, yeah, kids during it or teenagers during it. So they, he knew the lines of um, taking, of the, taking of the Tiger Mountain by heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's like a, like you said, it's like a Disney movie of their generation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, the, the natural sort of familiarity that he had when he sent those lines in the video uh, is kind of uncanny. Yeah. And um, this was a big thing in China because instantly um, he worked for the national TV station, right? They came out, they criticized him. They said, this, has, this thing has serious social consequences, even though it was a private banquet and it was clearly not broadcasting. He, he didn't mean for it to be broadcast and he, was, every, he was drinking and he made a joke and he was kind of drunk yeah yeah exactly but you know you can't you can't joke about it yeah so so this was a big thing in 2015 mm -hmm. um you know all over china new york times reported it it was knowing west in the west western world as well so i heard about it at the time yeah and i remember we talked about it we did but i didn't i mean i, I didn't know either <laughs> i i didn't know i oh, hadn't sorry. seen tiger mountain at that point yeah we, we what we didn't tiger know mountain was that show. he used tiger, he he did a parody of tiger mountain to uh mock yeah uh to mock Jeremy Mao. so and this this thing really was seen as a sort of a turning point or one of the signals right mm -hmm. the chinese society uh at that time 2015 was turning was you know going sort of backwards mm -hmm. um in terms Not of sure. it's going forward you, you saying xi jinping thought isn't the future <laughs> i'm making a face because i don't know what to say <laughs> no mouse thoughts is the future oh, right okay. so um so yeah so that's you know it's just interesting and i've asked some of my relatives you know older relatives if they had watched and they go of course i've <laughs> of course i've watched all of Ch all china has watched it yeah during those years but you but I have not. <laughs> you, so you you told me that you had seen things. I know the that book are, that are related to it, right? Yeah, I know of the book because it's adapted in um, movies when I was growing up, in TV shows when I was growing up. But you hadn't actually seen. But I didn't know it was one of the eight model, <laughs> model like operas. And you didn't realize it was as popular as it was. No. I I started reading about it and I was like, Cherry, we should watch this. And you're like, Why don't I have to watch this stupid? Like play propaganda piece. Propaganda piece. I'm trying to not. I, I'm trying to look away. Yeah, and I was like, "Hey, every, it's the most popular movie." Well, I was thinking about it, and I think some of my feelings really came towards because I grew up in '90s China, right? Not to give myself away, mm -hmm. uh, my age away, but uh, there was a time where this is not like. Not that we're trying to move on, but like that part of history mm -hmm. about cultural revolution, about how it happened, why it happened, what do we think about it? You don't talk about that, right? Yeah. You China has simply just moved on, mm -hmm. really, right? Like Tiananmen Square, China has just simply just moved on. Yeah. A generation just simply moved on. Let's just not talk about it. Let's just not talk about it, which is why, like, I wasn't, and also like because we have moved on so quickly with the econo uh, econ economic growth and all that. And um, we live in a completely different world, even though now we're going back. But, you yeah. know, when, like for, for a good 20, 20, 30 years, many aspects of the Chinese society, um, for people who grew up in it, the new generation, you don't get um, confronted by it at all if you don't go out of your way to look for it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't know. I mean, like, obviously, some people will say moving young was good. Right. Some people will say, you know, we just let's just make life better. Like Deng Xiaoping said. Right. Yeah. Like, or at least the, what the propaganda, the party line was. Uh, but at the same time, it's like clearly this was part of a generation's memory as the Chinese TV host drunkenly. <laughs> that's what he that's the lines he had chosen. That's the piece of propaganda he had chosen. To, that's what um, came out when he was drunk. Right. Yeah. My denial. <laughs> yeah. My feeling of denial came sort of from like my my education and the way i was brought up that and also like just my habit of well sort of looking away and not having to confront something hopefully that was interesting to people yeah we like talking about media from eras that are kind of alien historical artifacts Hysterica we think artifacts. they are yeah let us know what you think and i uh, hope everyone's doing well and uh, have a nice leave day. us a review on apple podcast if you could only if you liked it though. oh my god okay <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't like it, don't leave us a review. Still do. Privately DM us on Twitter and suggest <laughs> us to improve. And then once we've improved, then leave us a good review. 
Okay. <laughs> Is that so you, too is that too specific of instructions? For I don't know if anyone's gonna follow that. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll see. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. Have a nice day. See you next time.